For today's coverage, we are dealing with McGoogle versus Ventura. McGoogle deals with the Ninth Circuit, specifically California, which closed down all the gun shops in response to the virus. And some people say that's not fair. You can't do that. So we have two opinions for the price of one. Today, we're going to cover part one of two. The majority opinion written by the judge, and then later we'll cover the concurring opinion written by the same judge. For hilarity, it's good times. So let's read this case and see what it has to say. Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you'll enjoy this legal education content, and today may be the day I earn your subscription. For today's content, we are dealing with the Second Amendment and the Ninth Circuit, a combination that doesn't necessarily go well. Since Heller, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has heard 50 different cases involving the Second Amendment, and 50 different times the Second Amendment has lost. This will be number 51. Now, for, of course, for the moment, the Second Amendment has won because not all those cases were decided in the first instance by the Ninth Circuit. Some of them were reviewed on Bonk. So I suppose the question is, will this be number 51 in the series of the Second Amendment losing? Well, the person writing the majority opinion seems to think so, and they have some thoughts, but those thoughts will be saved for part two. First, let's deal with the law as it exists and the majority's opinion as relates to that. Let's get started with this. Judge Van Dyke writes a majority opinion and he'll also write a concurring opinion that we'll read in part two. The right of the people to keep and bear arms means nothing if the government can prohibit all persons from acquiring any firearm or ammunition. But that is what's happened in this case. Under California's highly regulated framework for firearms, law-abiding citizens can only obtain firearms and ammunition by arriving in person the government approves stores and ammunition stops. Yeah, there's no purchasing of ammunition or firearms online in California. And after purchasing the firearms, they must wait a minimum of 10 days to obtain it and sometimes longer. When COVID hit, Ventura County, California issued a series of public health orders that mandated a 48-day closure of gun shops, ammunition shops, and fire ranges. They did this while allowing other businesses like bike shops to remain open. The orders also prohibited everyone from leaving their homes other than for pre-approved reasons, which did not include traveling to gun or ammunition shops or firing ranges outside of the county. The orders therefore wholly prevented law-abiding citizens in the county from realizing their right to keep and bear arms, both by prohibiting access to acquiring any firearm and ammunition and barring practice at firing ranges with any firearms already owned. These blanket prohibitions on access and practice clearly burden conduct protected by the Second Amendment and fail under both strict and intermediate scrutiny. So yes, as the court points out, because of the stay-at-home orders, which were more strict in California than in many states, because they really were stay-at-home orders, um, they wouldn't allow you to travel except for protected reasons. And you couldn't go to a store to buy any ammo or guns because those stores were closed. And you couldn't buy them online and you couldn't travel to get them. So for at least 48 days in Ventura County, they had a complete ban on all Second Amendment, protect Second Amendment protected activity. As we have previously acknowledged, California has an extensive law regulating the sales and purchase of firearms. Well, that's definitely one way to put it for sure. Under California law, individuals can only complete the sale, loan, or transfer of firearms through a licensed firearms dealer. After purchasing, individuals must wait 10 days before receipt of the firearm. So yeah, there's quite a lot of restrictions to get access to a firearm or observe your basic Second Amendment rights in the great uh, constitutional uh, confederacy of uh, California there. Okay, so with this baseline in place, with California's super, super duper strict laws that make it basically impossible to purchase a firearm under normal, normal times, and now with the lockdown and the store closure making it even more impossible to buy firearms and ammunition under the present times, we, mount, we must decide whether or not this is constitutional. Okay, so let's do our constitutional tests. We must first decide whether the order's 48-day closure of gun shops, ammunition shops, and firing ranges burdens conduct protected by the Second Amendment based upon a historical understanding of the scope of the Second Amendment right.
to determine whether a challenge law falls outside the historical scope of the Second Amendment, we ask whether the regulation is one of the presumptively lossful regulatory measures identified in Heller, or whether the record includes persuasive historical evidence establishing the regulation at issue imposes prohibitions that fall outside the historical scope of the Second Amendment. Neither of these two threshold inquiries are met here. First, no party argues that 48-day closure of all gun shops, ammunition shops, and firing ranges in the county is one of Heller's presumptively lawful regulatory measures. While the appellees cite Silverster in arguing that California has a long history of delaying possession of firearms without impinging the Second Amendment, and that's cute because show me, you know, these 10-day waiting periods for other constitutional rights, but it's totally normal in California so it's totally fine, I guess. California's historical delays were far shorter than the 48-day mandated closure issue here, which actually amounts to 58 days when California's mandatory 10-day waiting period between purchase and possession is added to the ban. So California not super friendly when it comes to the possession of firearms. Meanwhile, if I want to go buy a firearm in Texas, I think I can just go to the corner store and, you know, give them money. So different philosophies, I guess. Because we determined that the orders burden conduct protected by the Second Amendment, you know, make it impossible to purchase firearms or ammo or practice. So if anything was a burden, one would imagine this would be. We proceed to the second level of the inquiry to determine the appropriate level of scrutiny. When ascertaining the appropriate level of scrutiny, just as in the First Amendment context, we consider how close the law comes to the core of the Second Amendment right and the severity of the law's burden on that right. Okay, so let me just help you out a little bit on that one and do my own back of the envelope analysis for you. How core is this to the right? How central? Now you can have this kind of discussion in the context of other amendments, right? You can have sort of like zones of importance and things that are more inside and outside zones. Like for example, in the first amendment context, uh, political speech is normally thought of as the apex of protection, right? It's, it's important to protect theater, and it's important to protect movies, it's important to protect songs, right? These are all important First Amendment goals, but it's not the apex of the First Amendment goal. The apex of the First Amendment goal is to protect political speech. Why? Because it's the very speech the government would want to ban the most. Why? Because you might speak against the government with said political speech, right? So it, other, other forms of uh, First Amendment speech are, in some sense, less important than the merely, like, enjoying, right? There are lesser forms of First Amendment speech. The core of First Amendment speech is for the political because we use it to challenge the state. Great. Okay, we can, we can accept these principles. They make sense. All right, so let's try to do that with the Second Amendment equivalent. Is this on the core or is this in the, in the periphery? Well, let's see. We're banning people from buying any firearms and any ammunition and we're prohibiting them from going online and buying it and having it shipped to them. And we're prohibiting them from traveling to a different county for the purposes of buying it. So we've enacted basically a complete ban of all firearms for all purposes uh, and practice with those firearms and so forth. So, you know, probably a little bit more core to the Second Amendment interest in the grand scheme. And how severe is the burden? Yes, that's how severe the, it is. It's just yes. Yes is the answer. It's, yeah. All right, let's read some more. All right, so now we have to go to everyone's favorite case of all time, Jacobson, and find out if Jacobson has anything to say about the Second Amendment. Now, one would wonder how, but I guess we got to do this analysis. So let's do that. Over 115 years ago, when the Supreme Court in Jacobson addressed whether a state statute requiring smallpox vaccines violated the inherent right of every free man to care for his own body and health in such a way as to him seems best, the Supreme Court said not so much, or at least they can mandatorily fine you for it. In Jacobson, after discussing the well-established principle of police power, which is the general power to do stuff, the court reasoned that the state legislature required the inhabitants of a city or town to be vaccinated only when, in the opinion of the Board of Health, this was necessary for the public health or public safety. The Supreme Court has also repeatedly affirmed that heightened scrutiny requirements still apply during times of crisis. 
In several cases evaluating public health orders issued in response to COVID, the Supreme Court applied strict scrutiny and ignored Jacobson entirely. Now, I'll spend just a moment on this paragraph here because it says the Supreme Court has confirmed that the requirements still apply in times of crisis. And a lot of you guys are probably screaming right about now that that's not true. But it's probably more true than you want to give credit for, right? The thing is that the standards didn't change. It's that the facts changed, right? So you, at least at least for a lot of it. Now, some of it is just the state going crazy, which is fair enough, right? But it's not as crazy as, it, it's, as a lot of people think, right? It's not that the government is violating the Constitution. It's just the facts are such that they meet tests that already exist and we already apply. It's just that normally those tests fail. They fail all the time. They fail like crazy. But in the case of this issue with like COVID, particularly, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, right? Then the, the it's not that the it's not that the these the scrutiny didn't apply. It's just that it was easier to meet the scrutiny because of the nature of the threat, particularly in the early days of COVID. So, you know. Some of it's BS. I'm just saying not all of it was BS, particularly earlier on where the threat was more unknown and the the government's actions were more defensible in face of an unknown threat. Now that we know as much, it's a little bit harder to defend under the same rationales because, again, the facts have changed. But that's a Jacobson analysis. Let's move back to the Second Amendment. Because Jacobson does not apply... Because for many reasons, first of all, it applies to whether or not people have to take the vaccine or pay a fine. So it applies to public health, which, you know, this is not. We must determine what level of heightened scrutiny applies, as we previously determined. A law that implicates the core of the Second Amendment right and severely burns that right warrants strict scrutiny. Both of those requirements are met here. I mean, this is about as core as the Second Amendment right as you can get. First, the orders implicate the core of the Second Amendment because they are focused on the ability to acquire arms and ammunition and maintain proficiency in the use of firearms, rights in which an en banc of this court has repeatedly acknowledged are necessary for the realization of the right for self-defense. In arguing against the application of strict scrutiny, the government relies on Sylvester and its holding that California's 10-day waiting period between purchase and possession warrants intermediate scrutiny. So saith the Ninth Circuit, waiting 10 days is not a problem to exercise a constitutional right. For no reason. In determining the applicable level scrutiny, the Silverster panel reasoned that contested regulation simply requires the plaintiff to wait the incremental portion of the waiting period that extends beyond the completion of the background check. How, how reassuring. Third, Silver Store's rationale turned on the government's claimed interest in a cooling off period, which is not an issue here. Here are the orders were the county's response to a temporary time of crisis, temporary being key, and trying to prevent this from coming permanent. Yeah. You know, just because we took away your First Amendment rights for a short period of time doesn't mean that that doesn't matter. Uh, any period of time in which your rights are infringed is a problem. Again, we could get into a more uh, nuanced analysis about whether your rights were infringed, particularly in times where things are uncertain and there might be a true existential threat, or at least the perception of that. But if your rights are violated, that presents a problem no matter how short it is. The orders attempt to stem the spread of COVID-19, which is unquestionably a compelling interest. But the recent Supreme Court COVID cases compel the conclusion, that's a lot of C's, that the Supreme Court's uh, orders are not the least restrictive means to further this compelling interest. The complete closure of all gun shops, ammunition shops, and firing ranges is far more restrictive than any COVID regulation that have previously come before the Supreme Court, as those activities only concern regulations limiting the capacity at activities that implicate fundamental rights, not an outright ban on those activities altogether. Here, as noted above, the order's stand, stated intent was to ensure the maximum number of persons stay in their places of residence to the maximum extent feasible, while enabling essential services to continue to slow the spread of COVID-19 to the maximum extent possible. Not only did appellees fail to provide any evidence or explanation suggesting that gun shops, ammunition shops, and firing ranges posed a greater risk of spreading COVID-19 than other businesses and activities deemed essential, 
but they also failed to provide any evidence that they considered less restrictive alternatives for the general public. It's not as if alternatives weren't available. The county eventually utilized one such alternative for those who had purchased firearms before March 20th by allowing receipt of those pre-purchased firearms on an appointment-only basis. It declined to extend this option to those who had not yet purchased a firearm, however, without any explanation. So the county itself found a solution and then proceeded to not apply that to new firearms. Thus, that brings us to the end of part one of the Ninth Circus decision in McDougall versus Ventura. In this case, the judge writes a decision stating that the Second Amendment was violated. Strict scrutiny has been violated. And there means scrutiny has been violated. All gun shops were closed. No one could go anywhere. No one could go to a gun shop to buy them. They couldn't order in ammo. They couldn't go to gun shops in neighboring counties. There were no gun shops available. And the Second Amendment was totally infringed. So the judge rules that this is an infringement on the Second Amendment. But the judge has some other thoughts. They, they wrote a mock opinion, uh, basically just writing the complete other side of the argument. So they kind of wrote a dissent from themselves, but it's hilarious. It's hilarious, and we're going to cover that next time. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.